Chapter Nine of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Nine, Cook River, Main Branch. Rough work, large boulders, Castle Rock, Rata trees, Shelf Camp, bad weather, short commons, Cave Camp. The main branch of Cook River had been prospected for gold some years previous to our exploration but as the diggers never bring out any information concerning the topography or appearance of the country their visits are not taken into account in fact it is often quite impossible to find out how far they had been up a valley sometimes the distances they say they went would land them in reality some miles out onto the mackenzie plains oh, i remember one fellow saying he had been eight miles along a certain ridge a fact which i doubted but on being pressed he admitted that, when he turned back, he had not reached the open grass, but he had gone quite eight miles by that time. Knowing the ridge well, I was able to say that he had not gone a mile and a quarter, as that would have brought him well up to the grass. While waiting at Ryan's, on our return from the Fox Glacier, for some provisions which were to come up from Gillespie's, the weather was perfect, but the fates were against us, and on the day the stores arrived, rain set in, and prevented a start until the twenty-ninth of April. Sending our camp, stores, and instruments in three loads of fifty pounds each, by pack-horse to the diggers' huts, we followed on foot, and crossed by the wire-rope and cage. With the usual colonial freedom, we boiled the billy, and had a meal in one of the huts before shouldering our loads. Such is the hospitality of the West Coast digger, that the owner of the hut would have been much hurt if we had not made ourselves at home, or had troubled to unroll the swags to get out our own provisions. Leaving about fifty pounds to bring up later, we took forty-five pounds each, and starting at one thirty p.m., travelled till nearly five o'clock without stopping, covering a distance of about four miles. This was my first experience of following up to its source, a river, which came down for any distance through the ranges. Hitherto this year, on the Waiho and Fox Rivers, the glacier and ice work predominated, and on the bow for the gorge prevented our following the actual river. In Cook River, however, we had to follow the valley, and very rough, slow work it proved. The distance covered on our first day was the longest we made during the trip, but on going over the same ground again the time was reduced considerably, as we not only knew the route, but had bush tracks blazed where necessary. The first mile or two were simple enough, merely alternate beaches of small stones, i.e. stones under three feet in diameter, and short stretches of large boulders, or rocky bluffs, against which the river ran deep, compelling us to take to the bush. I have already described what taking to the bush involves in the way of track cutting, so need only add that when compelled to leave the open river bed, the loads had to be put down, a track blazed, round or over the obstacle, to the next piece of open going, and a return made for the loads. After the junction of Cook and Balfour rivers, the hard work began. The valley narrows considerably, and has very steep sides, covered with dense bush and undergrowth, while below the bush, for perhaps thirty feet to the water, the valley is filled with gigantic boulders, varying in size from three feet to one hundred feet, and even one hundred and fifty feet, in diameter. These giant masses are not only lying in hopeless confusion in the bottom of the valley, but for some distance up the hillsides, where it is not too steep, boulders are found amongst and on top of which the great trees of the bush are growing. I should thoroughly enjoy a day or two travelling over such ground with nothing to carry, but it is far from amusing with forty or fifty pounds on one's back, even with one man helping the other. I really doubt whether in some places further up the river a man by himself could have managed to make any progress at all in the river bed. Often, when an impassable bluff rendered it necessary to go into the bush, one of us would slip down between two boulders into a wedge-shaped hole concealed by ferns, and after scrambling out again probably bark a shin in another hole. On finding the bush very bad going, we would decide to choose the least of two evils and go back to the open river bed. This probably necessitated a crawl under two boulders, through a small tunnel, perhaps ten or twenty feet long, with a muddy bottom or trickling water. The aperture would appear large enough to allow one to crawl through with a load, but after going a little way on hands and knees, one would have to lie down, because the load had proved too high for the tunnel. Then wriggling along, snake fashion, 
a little further and the tunnel becoming smaller the load would stick leaving one lying face down in mud or trickling water fairly unable to move the only way out of the difficulty is to allow the other man to lay hold of one by the heels and to submit in silence if possible to the ignominious and uncomfortable operation of being pulled out against the grain i do not know anything more trying to the temper than this operation and i think it speaks volumes for douglas and myself that the dog came back alive after emerging from a hole backwards with trousers above the knees shirt ruffled up round the neck and generally muddy many men would want to kill something on the same principle that some men swear at the caddy when they take their eyes off the ball at golf and come to grief having smoothed down the ruffled feelings and feathers we would take off our loads and go through passing them in front or pulling them behind it really makes little difference whether the swag is passed in front or behind because both methods involve sundry bumps on the head and skinned knuckles in addition to these performances boulders are met with to pass which one man has to stand on the other's shoulders and swarm up a smooth round stone then let down a rope and hoist the loads and the other man or the reverse is necessary in other places followed by more crawling under boulders and so on ad lib considering these obstacles and the necessity of carrying our loads it is not surprising that in one part of the river we were four days traversing four and a half miles in the narrowest part of the valley climbing crawling sliding scrambling and track cutting most of the time in westland there are many examples of this peculiarity where a clump of trees are growing on a high rock on which they will necessarily feel the want of water when they have grown to a respectable size one of the trees in such a position sends down a long arm which is not a root or branch but merely a sucker to the nearest water all the other trees on the rock then send out similar arms and fasten them on to the one which has first found water and in this way the whole clump benefits and flourishes further evidence of this peculiar law of nature is found in cases where seedlings have been deposited on a narrow ledge on the face of a precipice their position is a very precarious one when they grow to any size for a high wind will probably prove too much for them they therefore send an arm up the face of the rock or sometimes along it on the same level until it finds a crevice and here it fastens with a wonderfully tight grip these offshoots are found quite newly grown on trees that must be of considerable age immediately above our camp the river came boiling and foaming out of a gorge walled by sheer rock cliffs which would compel us to blaze a track up some height and along the top of the bluff from here about two miles further up the river and some height on the slopes of ryan's peak we saw a rock with scrub growing on the top which looked extraordinarily like her majesty's head on a jubilee coin instead of a crown the scrub formed a cap and with the snow sprinkled on the scrub it had the appearance of a black cap with white bands trailing out behind this rock must be two hundred feet in height from neck to crown and the overhanging piece forming the nose cannot project much less than thirty feet it is as perfect a natural bust as i have come across as seen from this camp and one or two points on the route past the gorge the next day the thirtieth douglas began to blaze a track over the bluff while i returned to the digger's hut for the sixty-pound load we had left behind and making a long day of it reached camp again at dark if the journey up to the camp had been hard work with two of us together it was doubly hard by myself and the manipulation of the pack at some of the large boulders much more difficult the down journey without the handicap of sixty pounds was made in three hours but the return took a good five hours chiefly owing to the number of times the load had to be roped up a boulder behind me and let down on the other side the worst place of all to manage alone was passed far more easily than i had any right to expect for while making up my mind how to get down without damaging my burden i overbalanced and fell thus solving the weighty problem without sustaining any damage when a man has a heavy load on his back a fall for a reasonable distance is of little consequence for the weight always causes him to fall on to the swag thus having a more or less soft buffer to resist the shock on the first of may we had time to look over some papers which we had received at ryan's a week previously the latest news in them was three weeks old but prior to seeing them we were nearly three months behind time we here first read the telegram announcing mr gladstone's resignation 
Douglas had not been able to reach the open river beyond the gorge on the previous day, so we spent the second in taking the track on through the gorge. When two work together, we generally arranged that while one blazes the track, the other follows and carries a load, which we leave at the end of the day and return to camp. The next day, bringing up the remainder of the stores, we camp at the point where the load was left, and while one prepares a shelter, the other, if necessary, continues blazing the track. The route through the gorge had to rise some seven or eight hundred feet before we could begin to edge down again to the river. At one point, the track followed the brink of the rocky cliff for fifty yards or more, and from here the precipice fell away sheer into the river for five hundred feet, while the opposite or eastern side was almost as precipitous. Away below was the river, looking like a small stream, now diving under and now foaming over immense boulders, while above and around us there were towering hills, covered with snow to within a thousand feet of where we stood. Opposite us was the deep-gorged valley of McBain's Creek, at the head of which Mount Tasman's ice-clad summit was just visible. Behind the deep valley, the lower portion clothed with luxuriant bush, could be seen to the inflow of the Balfour River, while Craig's Range and Peak rose abruptly in the background, looking very fine in its coating of autumn snow. Two hundred feet or so above this, we were able to begin edging down, and after crossing two large creeks which fell in fine cascades over large boulders, we descended rapidly to the river, wending our way down a very steep hillside, with great erratic blocks scattered on all sides. It is wonderful that some of these stones do not roll over into the river below, so precarious do their positions appear. On reaching the river we were dismayed at the task before us. It is hardly too much to say that here we found no small boulders at all. They were all of immense size, and completely filled the bottom of the valley, the river in places disappearing underneath them. In the middle of the stream was one we named the Egg Cup Rock, a large boulder, some forty feet high and one hundred and fifty feet round, estimated, had a hollow on one side of it, like an armchair, in which rested an egg-shaped stone, about fifteen feet long and perfectly loose, evidently left by a flood. It must not be supposed that a stone of this size is too large for a flood to move. During the great storm in February, there was, as already described, a high flood on the Callery River. After the flood went down, there could be seen a large, flat-shaped boulder of some fifteen feet square, by six or seven feet thick, which had been moved from its old position in the middle of the river, and was lying on its side on some other stones, quite ten feet above, and some thirty yards from its original place. The probability is that during a flood a large amount of debris fills the bed of the rivers, owing to a slip in the valley above, and the boulder is rolled along on the top of the false bed, and then the debris is scoured out again, leaving it high and dry. Whatever the means by which these large stones are moved, I feel confident that anyone who has seen a Westland River in an old man flood would credit the actual upheaval of any sized boulder. The power, force, and rapidity of the stream is simply appalling, and even the oldest west coaster will watch the mad career of the river, bringing down large trees, and listen to the boulders pounding and thumping along the bottom. As it was after midday and beginning to rain again, we left the load we had brought up under a stone and made our way back over the bluff to our camp. Some idea of this kind of work may be gained from our experience for the next three days. As the weather looked settled, and in order to lighten our loads, we had taken most of our stores ahead, leaving one day's food with the instruments, etc., in camp, expecting to be able to rejoin the stores again next day. Heavy rain, however, set in, and flooded everything, so we were cut off from supplies ahead, and had no chance of returning down the river. Expecting fine weather next day, we finished the remainder of the meat that evening, and consequently had two days in camp, with only a very limited amount of flour and rice. The remainder of our stores, namely flour, rice, oatmeal, suet, and cocoa, was above the gorge. On the evening of the second day we had finished the tucker in camp, having made the one day's food last two days. Therefore we were very thankful to find the sun shining next morning. Having to some extent dried our things to avoid the extra weight of carrying wet canvas, we went on through the gorge to our other load, intending to have a good meal before going any further. But as soon as we arrived, more rain set in, so, in spite of the fact that we had had nothing to eat since the previous evening, we at once began to make a shelter. After some fossicking, and a good deal of talk, 
we found a suitable place under a large stone which overhanging a little sheltered a ledge of some six feet broad by twenty feet long below this shelf there was a perpendicular drop of thirty feet and then a slope to the river here we decided to rig our canvas in case the wind changed and drifted the rain under the rock in camp i always slept on the side away from the fire which in this case we made against the rock thus i should have no protection against falling over the thirty feet in my sleep a very uncomfortable proceeding in a sleeping bag i therefore stipulated for a substantial barrier we felled a tree above us intending to roll the trunk down and place it on the outer edge of the shelf but of course with the usual cussedness of things it slid down nearly to the river having got it back to a level with the ledge we proceeded to put it in position and had just got it fairly straight when one end took charge and fell over the side a fork at the other end hooked douglas's leg nearly carrying him over too but luckily he grasped a root in the ground and hung there with the whole weight on his leg to fasten a rope round and secure the log to relieve him of the strain was the work of a minute and then we had to struggle with the other end to heave it back into position in due time and after much unparliamentary language we had both ends secured with a rope and the canvas pitched all this had to be done in a deluge of rain which combined with our long fast did not improve our tempers on the way up in the morning we had luckily shot a kaka which we had prepared and put into the billy to stew as soon as we arrived having kindled a fire before building our shelter at four p m taking off our wet things we hung them in front of the fire and having put our blankets round us until our clothes were dry we sat down at last to discuss the stew which by this time was ready it may be imagined that the billy looked very foolish when we had finished hard work and a twenty-four hours fast tend to give a man a good appetite this camp was no place to stay in if we could find a better because it was on a very steep hillside and there were many loose boulders lying about which showed that falling stones or slips had to be feared in wet weather it is never quite safe to camp on a steep sidling in heavy rain for in westland large landslips are common in the ranges during or after a storm consequently we left early next morning and in three hours had succeeded in advancing about three-quarters of a mile further up the river here we found a large boulder forming with two others a fair cave which we soon turned into an excellent shelter and spent several days in perfect comfort this three hours was i think about the hardest bit of travelling we had and as we toiled along now crawling now climbing under and over the great boulders i could not help comparing our progress to that of two ants crossing a newly metalled road the difficulties in our path proved too much on several occasions for poor betsy who had to be hoisted about in the most rough and ready manner fortunately our loads got lighter by a pound or so every day so we knew that on having to face this part of the river again our burdens would be considerably lighter considering the contents of the swags we carried and the usage they received up this river it is wonderful that so little damage was done there were fifteen pounds weight of instruments photographic material and field books in each load before any things in the shape of camp or stores were added and as these have to be rolled in a blanket and a piece of canvas with a lot of mixed articles it would not be surprising if damage ensued from the hauling and dumping they received over the large stones which were too slippery to negotiate under a handicap of sixty pounds but i do not remember having an instrument camera or plates damaged once during the season in spite of rough usage damp fire or floods with the exception by the way of half a dozen glass plates broken before exposure and four half plates after the latter however were probably damaged in the pack-horse mail up the coast the cave camp though airy was very comfortable it had like our usual shelters a roof and two walls but there was only room to sit and lie down it was a foot too low to allow one to stand up the weather was now becoming very wintry and cold snow fell two or three times but did not lie permanently within three hundred feet of the cave our food too was getting monotonous flour and rice were all we had and a very limited amount of each of those because having got no birds on which we always relied the stores brought up had to bear a double strain or we had to be satisfied with very small rations we used often to wish that we could see the picture which would present itself to a man coming up the river 
if any one had by chance followed us he would have seen a low-roofed cavity under a huge boulder in which sat two ragged men on a log in front of a large fire and a hungry-looking dog lying close by the men would be of doubtful nationality having long unkempt hair and beards and with skins as brown as a penny in all probability their clothes would be hanging at the side of the fire drying and they would be sitting with their blankets wrapped round them smoking their pipes and possibly playing a game of cribbage with a pocket-book marked out as a board or perhaps both would be reading one lying down on the dry scrub which served as bedding and the other sitting up periodically the dog would get up and stretching herself would put on a piteous blind man's dog look in hopes of coaxing a little something to eat but without success a picture of this kind appears dismal and i suppose the reality was about as depressing as one could imagine the hours would drag slowly along because we could only afford two small doughboys or suet dumplings for each meal and only two meals a day the weather was too bad to allow us to work and it seemed little use looking at the aneroid barometer which however we did constantly in hopes that it would rise but even the barometer seemed to have very little effect on the weather wet days with plenty of food are not unpleasant as we could spend considerable time in cooking an elaborate question mark meal but when hungry and with nothing to cook it is painfully dreary after consulting our watches periodically during the day one of us would exclaim by jove it's six o'clock at last let's sling the billy right you are what are we going to eat i vote for grilled chops some bread and cheese and a long beer oh i'm tired of chops let's have some steak and kidney pie and a welsh rarebit to follow the steak is too tough what do you say to deviled kidneys they give me indigestion well then goose and applesauce i'm sick of geese you're so confoundedly particular shall we have some doughboys good idea let us have a doughboy for a change now we had been eating doughboys for breakfast and doughboys for tea for some days and even then only one doughboy the size of a man's fist but such is the depressing effect of wet weather and short rations that we were really amused at our little joke and probably repeated it again next morning i recollect one evening when very hungry telling douglas of the winter dinner of the alpine club in london at which i was in eighteen ninety two and we both felt quite cheerful after thinking of so many good things in the evening we generally had a game or two of cribbage discussed various items of news three or four days old which we had just gleaned from the papers and at soon after eight o'clock boiled the billy again and made a small drink of cocoa at nine p m having made up a large fire we rolled into our respective blankets and dreamed of city banquets and good living until daylight End of chapter nine chapter ten of pioneer work in the alps of new zealand by arthur paul harper this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail timmerman vaughan chapter ten cook river concluded and ancient glaciers as soon as possible we went on partly by track cutting and partly in the river-bed amongst the worst boulders we had yet seen it was not a case of climbing over those stones because that was impossible we simply had to crawl and squeeze in and out amongst them until we could find a place to leave the river and get on to the hillside where we blazed a track this was rendered necessary because the boulders were practically impassable for half a mile in three and a half hours when we had gone perhaps a mile certainly not much more we came to the largest boulder in the river this is named tony's rock and must have come down on an ancient glacier from a mile and a half to two miles up the valley it is not the same formation as that of ryan's peak under which it lies behind it on the slope and leaning against it are several other giant stones but not nearly so large above it the river bed is easier and more open only a few large boulders appearing the dimensions of tony's rock are height one hundred and fifty six feet aneroid circumference eight hundred and forty three feet we were unable to measure more than the three sides of the stone as the fourth had other stones heaped against it however we agreed at the time that the figure quoted was not over the mark as the three sides alone exceeded seven hundred feet i do not know the dimensions of known erratic blocks in other parts of the world so cannot say how this compares with them douglas states that he measured one in the waipara a branch of the arawata river behind jackson's bay 
and it showed slightly over two hundred feet in height, with a girdle a trifle under one thousand feet. In that locality there are several nearly as large, and one, which he could not measure, perhaps a little larger. Of these, however, I cannot speak from personal observation. The boulders in Cook River between Castle Rock and Tony's Rock are only approached by some in the Copeland River below Welcome Flat, for number and size. As the lower side of Tony's apparently gave capital shelter, we decided to move our quarters at once, but before reaching Cave Camp again more rain set in, so we stayed there for the night. Next morning was cold and wet, snow falling at the cave, but at noon we packed our loads, and during a lull in the storm made for Tony's Rock. Before reaching it, however, another snowstorm came on, and making the bush cold and wet drenched us and our loads very quickly. A short distance below Tony's Rock, the whole river goes over a fine fall of some fifty feet in height, caused by two large boulders obstructing its course. In the middle of the narrow channel, a knob of rock, not unlike a camel's head, makes the water rise in a wave six or eight feet high, and spread out in a fan-shaped mass of foam. Behind this fall, I believe one could walk and cross the river bed dry shod, for it shoots out a considerable distance. The effect is very striking, as the river is by no means a small one, and in summer it would be even finer, for there would be a larger volume of water. The difficulty of obtaining a photograph of this fall afforded a good example of the size of the boulders. Hearing the roar of the water when cutting the track, we climbed a tree to look ahead, and saw the fall some two hundred yards or more further up the river. We therefore went to the edge of the bush, and found that, in order to get a good view, the camera should be out in the open. It was by no means easy to get down again into the river from the bank, which was formed of a series of large stones, against which the debris from the hillside has been heaped up. Determined, however, to get my photograph, I slid down the smooth surface of one of the rocks, and landed safely on to the top of another, some twenty-five feet below and was even then thirty feet above the water, on a flat boulder, off which I could not get, for it was standing in the river separated from the others, except on the side I had come down. Having taken the photograph, it was impossible to climb back, without help, up the smooth face down which I had come, and as we had left the rope at the cave, Douglas had to go back into the scrub to look for a pole, which was not easy to find owing to the vegetation, being gnarled and twisted at this altitude, However, he found one, which was just long enough for me to catch hold of, and having passed up my boots and camera, I was able with bare feet, and help from Douglas, to scramble to the top again. There is nothing exciting about this incident, but it helps, to some extent, to show how large the stones were. Just before reaching Tony's Rock, Betsy caught us the second bird we had found since leaving Castle Rock a week before. It was a decided curiosity in the shape of a white kiwi and no doubt its skin would be valuable, but as usual, hunger for meat overcame scientific ardor, so we made it into stew. The skin is the most nutritious part of a kiwi, therefore we could not afford to keep it for stuffing. Heavy snow fell again in the night, covering the ground round our shelter, which was some three thousand feet above sea level, and to our disgust we found that this palatial residence was a fraud, for the water trickled down on the inside and wetted us wherever we tried to sleep. I have always noticed that whenever there is a leak in canvas or rock, it always happens to occur exactly above one's face. The night was bitterly cold, as we had left our canvas at a lower camp, and the shelter under Tony's rock was so large that it was practically the same as sleeping in the open. We had not even our roof and two walls. The morning broke clear and frosty, but snow was lying a foot or more deep all around, and instead of melting, would in all probability lie in for the rest of the winter gradually increasing in depth, until the valley would be entirely blocked. It is hard to credit the amount of snow which collects in these narrow valleys in winter. Some must have two hundred or three hundred feet, piled up in them, during a bad winter, by the heavy storms and frequent avalanches. More snow falls in the winter in New Zealand Alps than most persons would imagine, considering the temperate latitude, and in the spring it melts with great rapidity, causing heavy floods in the rivers. As our stock of provisions was now nearly finished, we decided to push up the river for one day, lay off the head of the valley hastily, and retreat before more bad weather delayed us indefinitely. Following the valley for some little distance, we turned up a creek off Ryan's Range on the right, and after a great deal of wading and pounding through soft snow and snow-covered scrub, 
reached a point from which we could complete the map of the valley. The snout of the La Perouse glacier lay below us, a mile to two miles further up the valley, and the river flowed over a bed of smaller stones, which were easy to travel on until Tony's Rock was reached, after which it begins a rapid descent through the boulder-filled valley up which we came. Such a large basin at the head is unexpected, and like the Balfour Valley, is a great deal wider than we had anticipated. This is owing to the very precipitous nature of the Balfour and Copeland ranges, between which the river flows. Above Tony's Rock, the valley turns with a wide sweep to the left, and opens out on the south bank, while on the northern side the Balfour Range continues steeper than before. From the glacier to the bend in the river, the south bank slopes back more or less gently for perhaps half a mile, showing three or four old moraine terraces covered with low, dense mountain scrub. Behind these slopes, Mount Copeland and Little's Peak rise abruptly in immense precipices of two or three thousand feet. Mount Stokes, La Perouse, and Hicks apparently block the head of the valley, while Mount Cook shows over Harper's Saddle. The La Perouse Glacier, however, comes off the main range between Mount Tasman and Dampier, the upper portion lying away to the left, round another bend, only the snout and lower portion of the glacier being visible until a higher point on Ryan's range is reached. As seen in May 1894, the picture describes description. The valley was blocked with snow to the water's edge, the river looking like a black ribbon in the white snow, as it flowed down the valley in graceful curves. The giant cliffs of Copeland and Little's Peak were white from base to summit, the snow having been blown against the steep faces and frozen by the cold wind and frost of the night, formed glistening icicles. At first there was little black rock to relieve the dazzling whiteness of the landscape, but after the sun had been up some hours, the precipices began to shed their white mantle, and the steep buttresses and couloirs began to show their shapes and forms. Now and then the stillness, which was almost oppressive, was broken by a slight hissing noise, which gradually increased into a roar, as a great avalanche poured down over cliffs of Little's or Ryan's Peak. One descended within three hundred yards of us, bounding over a sheer drop of seven hundred feet or more, like a great waterfall, about fifty yards broad, and lasting for two or three minutes. Our clothes had become very tattered and worn, owing to the rough usage coming up the river, and afforded us very little warmth. Consequently, the morning's work, wading through snow and bruising under and over snow-covered scrub, had chilled us to the bone. Yet when we had finished our observations, we were loth to leave such a glorious view, in spite of the cold and hunger. I have often wondered what we should have thought of that scene, if we had been warmly clad and well fed, because my experience is that discomfort spoils the enjoyments of a view to some extent, and if we admired the head of Cook River, as we saw it in our somewhat wretched condition, how much more beautiful would it have appeared under pleasanter circumstances. Down the valley to the north we could see a bank of angry-looking clouds rolling in from the sea, and already settling down over Craig's range, so we dared not stay any longer, in case another storm prevented our getting down the river. Therefore, hurrying back to Tony's Rock, we packed our loads without delay, and made for the cave, which we reached about sunset. Here a good fire and an extra doughboy each, including Betsy, soon made us forget the discomfort of a day's work in soft snow and ragged garments. On the way down we saw a cuckoo, and his usual companion the check-shirt bird. It is not customary to find these birds in the mountains during the early winter, as they generally migrate to warmer latitudes at the end of the summer and return in the spring. The former is the Maori Koikwa, Eudinimus tetensis, and like his English namesake, he makes use of other birds' nests. The check shirt follows him in his migrations, and is often seen with him in the lower hills. I heard a curious story connected with this little wanderer, told by a friend of mine in a digger's hut. He said that sailors believe these birds to represent the spirits of drowned men, and that it is therefore unlucky to kill them. On one occasion he was down south, below Gillespie's, and with five others was trying to shoot a check-shirt bird close to the hut of another digger, whom I shall call Mac. Old Mac came out to where they were shooting, and begged them to desist, for it was bad luck, he said, and meant a violent end to those concerned in the death of the bird. Of course, his hearers laughed at the idea, but he was very earnest, and said he would give them evidence of the truth of his statement. Taking them into his hut, he related his own life's history. He was one of a party of Newfoundland fishermen, who left their homes in a ship built by themselves for Australia 
in the early days of the gold diggings. When a few days away from land, they discovered that, though all were sailors, they knew nothing about navigation. Consequently, the ship drifted about aimlessly for weeks. In the course of time, they fell in with a man of war, and discovered that instead of being near the Cape of Good Hope, they were off the horn. The commander of the warship put a man on board, with a knowledge of navigation, and he piloted the unfortunate ship to Adelaide, from whence they all went to the gold fields. Mac had no luck, so he shipped on board a trading schooner to the islands, and all went well till some man was fool enough to kill a check-shirt bird. From that day their luck changed, and ultimately they lost the schooner in a gale. Five or six men succeeded in getting away in an open boat, and were afloat for many days. The boat was picked up by a steamer near Auckland, and in it were four dead bodies, and a living skeleton, almost a maniac from his fearful sufferings. This was old Mac. It was a long time before he recovered, and was able to go down to Westland to try his luck again on a goldfield. My informant assured me that the manner in which the old fellow related his tale, and the power with which he described his awful time in the boat, with the dead bodies, too weak to throw them overboard, exceeded anything he had ever read. Mac ended his yarn by saying, Anyway, you can't kill them with shot. You must use silver. Out of consideration for the old sailor's feelings, my friend took no further part in the proceedings, but he remembers as he went away, seeing a man cutting up a half-crown. Whether they killed the bird or not, he never heard. All he can say is that three out of the five died violent deaths, and as the others have gone away, he cannot say what became of them. As he said, it is one of those curious coincidences which tend to strengthen people's belief in superstitions. One long day from the cave camp took us to the diggers' huts, where one of our friends insisted on our staying, and we enjoyed a good meal for the first time for ten days. But as he was short of meat, we pushed on next morning to Ryan's hut, to find it empty and nothing to eat, only one or two rotten potatoes. These were naturally hardly good enough. Therefore, on the following day, we started breakfastless to Mr. Wilson's survey camp at Cook River Settlement, seven miles away over the flats. Here Bill Boyd, the cook, with the help of mutton, vegetables, and plum duff, soon persuaded us that life was, after all, worth living. It may perhaps be thought that we only had ourselves to blame for short rations and starvation on this trip, but I think it was our misfortune, not our fault. In the first place, the valley was unexplored, and we had every right to look forward to as many birds as we had need of for food, and as we always rely greatly on these, we only took enough food to last us for the trip, with help of birds. Again, we did not anticipate more than ten days' work at the most, so we took flour, rice, oatmeal, tea, cocoa, sugar, a little meat, treacle, suet, for cooking doughboys, and a tin or two of sardines in sufficient quantity, plus birds, to last us for that period. Had we found birds, as we reasonably anticipated, the provisions we took would with care have lasted more than two weeks, and even if they were exhausted, we could have lived well with the help of the pea-rifle. The luck was against us in every respect. For the first three or four days we had meat, and went on eating as if there was no need to economize. By that time we had gone some way up the river, and the bad weather not only prevented a retreat, but delayed our advance. Consequently, having only caught the kiwi and kaka, we had to live for ten days relying entirely on the stores which were left, and which, owing to delays, would only keep us reasonably if we had found plenty of game. To give some idea of the help that we derive from birds, I may safely say that stores, which would usually last for ten days comfortably, would only give perhaps three days of good meals in the event of finding no birds. It is no joke to be compelled to divide six good meals, consisting of flour and rice, into rations to extend over ten days, and at the same time do a considerable amount of heavy work. The less said about our clothes, the better. After a long season of eight months in the ranges, the constant wet, rough usage in bush and scrub, etc., soon made havoc of the best materials. The only original garment of mine now in existence is a coat of Burberry's gabardine, which lasted me without tearing for the whole of this season and the next, and is now gracing the back of a digger down south, and he still swears by it. Some valleys are so narrow that, if they run east and west, there are places in them which never get the sun, winter or summer. 
here the bush which grows just as luxuriantly is always wet and if we are above bush line snow or creeks wet us daily ordinary tweeds therefore become rotten and are easily torn i find the best costume to be a flannel shirt woolen jersey and thick knitted woolen drawers without trousers and some spare canvas to patch with it is absolutely necessary to wear flannel or wool next to the skin owing to the constant wet and woolen garments underneath trousers are too hot for my comfort so i generally dispense with the latter after a few months one may be said to be wearing a number of patches connected together by woolen material after leaving cook river i decided to go north to hokitika as winter would prevent further work and there were two hundred or more photographs to develop and print also sundry work to be done in the office to complete the field work accordingly having spent a few days in photographing the wondrous panoramas and other views from the flats and sea bluffs i tramped with my goods and chattels some thirty miles along the beach to okarito here i obtained a horse from the mailman and in three days arrived at hokitika after a spell of nearly eight months in a batwing six of which were spent in the ranges chiefly on new ground our work up cook river finally settled a doubtful point in the topography of the district namely the course of the balfour range when in eighteen ninety blackiston and i made the first ascent of harper's saddle at the head of the hooker glacier we were unable owing to the fog to see clearly down to the west coast on our return i was asked by the westland survey department firstly what was the true course of the divide secondly was the balfour range an offshoot of hicks st david's dome or tasman the first question i answered without hesitation but the second had to be left for future solution on looking at the map made from distant trigonometrical stations i was inclined to believe that there was an error in the balfour glacier and range because if the latter was an offshoot of the divide near tasman it left such a ridiculously small neve for the glacier which was shown to be four or five miles long the la perouse glacier had been put in by guesswork and it was more than probable that it was shown far too large and that its upper basin really belonged to the balfour glacier this would mean that the balfour range was an offshoot of mount hicks and not of tasman or possibly might be a detached range in the event of the latter being the case the large neve alluded to would supply both glaciers however up cook river and from ryan's peak later on the truth was evident and it is now finally settled that the balfour range comes off the divide just south of mount tasman also the la perouse is a large glacier as shown on the map and nearly clear of surface moraine the glacier is nearly five miles long and descends by a fine ice fall from its neve flowing in graceful curves between high precipices with one or two tributaries from the east it has but little surface moraine as compared with other new zealand glaciers having only a fringe of debris on each side and being completely covered near its terminal face about a quarter of its length from the snout a peculiar bar of moraine running across it from side to side looks as if a large slip had come down and shot right across the ice the course of the balfour range having been settled it only remains to find some reason for so large a glacier as the balfour which is six miles long flowing from such an insignificant neve i have already described this glacier with its neve detached from its trunk the only available theory so far as i can see is that the great western face of tasman which rises abruptly in precipices for over seven thousand feet from the glacier is too steep to hold much snow it faces southwest the cold quarter and must catch an immense quantity of snow in the winter which comes down frequently in large avalanches filling the upper end of the valley and forming the trunk of the glacier there are also no doubt avalanches from craig's range on the northern side of the glacier and these bring down masses of debris and broken rock which completely cover the ice and to a large extent protect it from the sun's heat the steep ranges surrounding the valley must also prevent the sun from reaching the glacier in the winter and also part of the day in the summer when douglas explored the left-hand branch of the copeland river a tributary of the karangarua in eighteen ninety two he noticed that though mount stokes apparently dropped without interruption to the strontian glacier the avalanches from the peak never reached the bottom but appeared to be swallowed up halfway down the slope this led him to expect one of those peculiar instances of the broken nature of the ranges in the form of a large fissure in the mountain side or a narrow deep gorge with an outlet into cook river 
we were therefore looking out for such a cleft when at the head of the river and found that his suspicions were correct for a narrow and dark gorge comes into the valley evidently containing a small glacier formed by avalanches there was too much snow to see whether a glacier really existed but we decided that there was a small one the stream from it flows into cook river a short distance below the la perouse glacier the cook river glaciers were evidently in the past of considerable size to judge by the numerous moraines and terraces in the upper and lower parts of the valleys the stream of ice which came down the main valley was probably the largest and its marks are to be seen on the lower end of the balfour range a considerable height above the river on the slopes under ryan's peak the erratic blocks scattered on the hillside show that the ice must have been seven hundred feet thick at the least below tony's rock after forcing its way down the valley of the cook river it would be joined by a stream of ice which came down the balfour valley from mount tasman of the day between mcbain's creek and the balfour river is a rounded hill which has evidently been shaped by glacier action and must at one period have been completely covered with ice behind this hill to the east is a low flat depression showing that the ice after shrinking somewhat had still found its way into the main glacier down mcbain's creek as well as the balfour gorge and on shrinking still further it had ceased to flow down the creek and only found one outlet through the gorge of the present river after being augmented by this ice stream and a smaller one from craig's range the glacier would flow down to the flat country probably joining the ice from the fox valley and from the south there is little doubt from douglas's observations in the many rivers he has explored that the general direction of the ancient ice flow was north my own observations small though they are in comparison with his tend to support his theory in the south there is perhaps as fine an ancient moraine as anywhere in westland namely the cascade moraine which begins at two hundred feet and goes back gradually rising to nineteen hundred feet in height formerly it projected four miles out to sea to open bay island which has some moraine debris on it in this moraine douglas who explored that country some years ago found several red stones which had come north from the red hill country in no case has he discovered any red rocks lying south of that country but always north an interesting feature about the cascade moraine from a geologist's point of view is that it is stratified and in some of the layers seashells are to be found well inland other evidences of the northern flow of the ice is to be found in the old wanganui and hokitika glaciers in the two rivers of these names there are belts of serpentine rock pieces and blocks of which douglas has found north of these rivers but never south in the waitaha river for instance he found several proofs that an ancient glacier came over from the wanganui country to that valley carrying with it blocks of serpentine rock the morainic drift of the ancient franz joseph and Callery glaciers is to the north round lake maparica and could be traced even further than that and the greatest mass of drift near cook river lies to the north and if this theory of the ice flow is correct it would belong to the old glacier the whole of the low country is covered with morainic hills and terraces of various heights up to three hundred or four hundred feet at intervals along the sea beaches these terraces form the bluffs already mentioned it has been assumed from past observations made in the low country only that the old glaciers flow direct to the sea between these high terraces this however i venture to think is the wrong view to take my belief is that the ancient glaciers being some six hundred feet thick at the point they left the valleys would spread out over an immense area when the lateral pressure of the hillsides was removed probably at one time they joined and formed a vast sea of ice at the foot of the hills covered with a heavy mass of moraine caused by constant denudation in the mountains when the period of retreat began they separated again and gradually retired up the valleys leaving a confusion of moraine hillocks all over the lower country this vast accumulation of morainic drift would be gradually cut through by the rivers thus forming the high terraces now seen along the river sides and which have hitherto been taken for lateral moraines if the theory here advanced be correct then the terraces would not necessarily be either terminal or lateral moraines but merely accidental embankments carved into their present shape by the rivers should however the theory that they are lateral moraines be the right one then i am at a loss to understand what caused the vast collection of morainic deposits between the rivers and in places 
along the foot of the hills where no valleys exist it seems that those accumulation of drift hills lying north of the waiho river and also north of cook river must have been left by the great ice flow extending all over the low country and had it not been for the rivers of a later date cutting broad valleys to the sea they would have extended over the whole coast in hopeless confusion and no long terraces would have existed at all from the taramakau river to bruce bay twenty miles south of gillespies the rivers have cut through old morainic accumulations which extend from the hills in many cases to the present sea beach and from bruce bay to jackson's bay the sea bluffs are rocky and the old moraines do not appear again till after the latter place is passed there has been in the past a considerable amount of gold brought out of cook river but at the present time two or three diggers only make a small living just above the point where the river leaves the hills traces or colours of gold have been found a considerable distance up the main branch but not payable and in the balfour gold was obtained in the sixties which paid well i believe at the junction of the two rivers and was traced right up to the glacier harry the whale and dick nickel two old fossickers are said to have discovered the balfour glacier in eighteen sixty six but it is quite useless to consider the journeys made by diggers for they never bring out any information that is reliable how far up cook river they went it is hard to say though a tradition exists of harry the whale german harry and tony the greek having gone up some miles and crossed the copeland range into architect creek which flows into the copeland river the enterprising old school of diggers and prospectors is fast dying out but paddy mckenna an old man now and then makes solitary trips up the balfour where he is commonly supposed to have located a gold-bearing reef it is sad to see these old-time prospectors disappearing and no one to take their places the younger generation on the west coast have a strong dislike i may say fear not only of the hard work and life entailed by journeys into the ranges but also have a rooted objection to going off the beaten track they are good enough men on horses after cattle near their huts but neither love nor money will tempt them to go far afield End of chapter ten Chapter eleven of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter eleven The Franz Joseph Glacier. Second visit. Winter snow. Successful ascent to Neve. Ice formation. Moraine formation. Old moraines and glaciers. Advance and retreat june july and august being our winter months it was useless to attempt any hill work therefore after six weeks office work in hokitika i returned to christchurch for a few weeks holiday unlimited golf and sundry expeditions of my lantern slides before the new zealand alpine club and other institutions made the time pass quickly and before i had well shaken down to civilized life it was time to return from our work on the Franz Joseph Glacier during the previous summer, it was evident that early spring was the best season for attacking the ice fall and upper ice. I therefore obtained permission to try and reach the Neve in September, and at the same time to make observations as to when to retreat or advance, and generally supplement the former report. On September 13, 1894, I arrived at the Forks, and after some difficulty obtained a man to accompany me to the glacier. The mere mention of going on to the glacier frightened most of the young fellows in the district. However, one of them joined me, in spite of warnings from his mates, prepared to face all sorts of unknown evils. Friday, September 14th. We pitched the bat wing in the same place as last year at Camp 1, and had everything ready by 3 p.m. While looking about in the scrub round camp in the evening for a straight pole to use in camp, I found a small case for carrying soap, which I had lost last year. A weka must have taken it away from camp before we left in February. Saturday, September 15th. Grand weather, very cold, even here in the mornings. Made a traverse of the terminal face, which showed general retreat, a new rock appearing by number one Harper's Rock. In the afternoon we fossicked a route over to the north side landing, a little further up than last year, near the first small ice fall, ice very broken and troublesome went along the side to Rope Creek, a 
and found the ice so far retreated that we could not get down without a rope, left a small load here, which we brought along to lighten the weight tomorrow. Hailstorm in the evening. Sunday, September 16th. Moved to Camp 2 in the afternoon with fly only. Raining all the morning and showers during the afternoon. Cold quarters up here, with only one blanket at this time of the year. Rigged up fly in the usual way, with two end windbreaks. Our little female weka of last year still here, and seems very glad to see us. Very tame. Monday, 17th. Tried all the morning to find a route on to the glacier. My mate did not appreciate the pleasures of being let down into a crevasse to cut steps, nor of going along steep sides of the hummocks in small footholds. After three attempts we found a route two hundred yards further up than last season. Not by any means a good one, but safe enough at this time of the year. Went up to Camp 3 to see if we could camp there. Also marked our line with rotted twigs through the extraordinarily crevassed and broken ice below Cape Defiance. Found deep snow on the bank at Camp 3. Should only save an hour and a half by camping there, and should have to break a day if we moved up tomorrow, so returned to Camp 2. Found that the rata twigs saved about one half of the time taken in going up. The ice here is simply a maze of long ridges, very narrow, between deep crevasses, and in such an uneven fashion that I could not see a route for certain more than one hundred yards ahead. Consequently, we were often forced to retreat our steps, having been blocked. Fixed three measurement cairns between camp and point E, the rocky cape on eastern bank, in the afternoon. Bathed, baked bread, made a stew, changed my plates, and lost my temper in the evening. N.B. I presume the fire smoked when I was baking, but cannot remember. Tuesday, September 18th. Glorious moonlight last night. Up at 2.45 a.m., but did not leave camp till 4 a.m. My mate did not see much catch in getting up so early in the winter and wanted to know, what's the odds of an hour or two? Glacier and ranges looked simply magnificent by moonlight. Could see everything quite clearly. Even on the low country we were able to distinguish some features, and beyond it the sea. Travelled quickly to just below Cape Defiance when the moon dipped down behind Mount Moltke, leaving us in deep shadow right in the middle of the rough ice. Blundered along slowly, the deep crevasses looking very ghostly as we crawled along the narrow ridges in the dark. Now and then would see a rotted twig faintly. As dawn came up we got out of the crevassed ice and were opposite the Unzerfritz waterfall. Had it not been for the rotted twigs we should have been quite an hour longer in the rough going. Unser Fritz was silent, frozen from top to bottom in one icicle, 1,209 feet in length. The absolute silence of so large a fall was very imposing. We put on the rope halfway up the ice fall, and were opposite Almer Glacier at 8 a.m. and had breakfast. Snow covered everything, but all the seracs were standing just the same, the snow bridges being some 10 or 15 feet below the general level of the glacier. For a few chains above the inflow of the Almer, I thought every moment that we should be stopped, the hummocks and seracs formed a perfect labyrinth, and the crevasses between them were not bridged very strongly. I have never in all my experience seen such a hopeless confusion of broken, crevassed, and generally rough ice. The snow became painfully soft after 10 a.m., but we pounded along, taking turns in the lead. And as we were now high up in the neve, there was little or no chance of going through into crevasses. The snow was so deep. At noon we were well up into the southeastern corner of the head basin, and there I was able to do all that had to be done for the map. The plan which we made the previous summer is practically correct, and only one or two minor corrections to be made. We went on a little further, to within about a mile and a half, perhaps less, of Graham's saddle to the Tasman. I wanted to go on, and at least ascend Graham's saddle, but my companion was a firm believer in the eight hours' day, and would not consent to more, so I had to suit myself to him, more or less. I told him that now he had done all that was necessary, and anything else we did would be voluntary work for our own amusement, and asked him if he was willing to go over to the Tasman. He was decided in his objections, as he had had enough of this bloomin' work, and didn't give a D for the scenery. He was paid for a day's work only, and had done that. I therefore gave up the idea, wondering at such a lack of enthusiasm. We started back at 1 p.m., travelled as fast 
as the very soft snow would allow to the top of the icefall and having our tracks to follow took very little time in passing the serac ice i feared that the snow bridges would be weaker so lengthened the rope to thirty feet and always kept a hummock of ice between us this was necessary for the leader on two occasions crossed a crevasse safely and mounted a hummock but on going down into the next hollow to be ready in case the second man broke the bridge he would go bodily through the snow and the bridge which he had safely crossed would let the second man through thus we were both in crevasses with the rope taut over the intervening hummock to scramble out was no trouble and beyond confirming my mate in his opinion that he had got into most dangerous company no harm was done we reached camp about five p m very burnt with the new snow the day having been cloudless throughout i very much doubt if the snow would last for another two weeks of sufficient strength to allow a route to be found in rough seracs at the top of the ice fall the neve of the glacier is roughly a circular basin of three miles in diameter and is surrounded by some fine peaks between nine thousand and ten thousand feet out of the southern side the peaks of the dividing range rise in pinnacles and knobs of rock out of the sea of ice affording interesting rock climbs the first ascents of the peaks from de la beche nine thousand eight hundred and thirty five feet to conway nine thousand six hundred and eleven feet will probably be done from this glacier as their slopes toward the tasman are clothed with hanging glaciers which send down avalanches night and day during the summer on the southeastern side the range dividing the franz joseph from the watershed of the calorie branches from the minaret ten thousand twenty two feet and has three nice peaks in st mildred's drummond's and stirling rock the two latter are very easy climbs of snow the former a rock climb entirely the peaks of the bismarck range are on the whole disappointing from this side as they are merely small peaks of rock standing five hundred to one thousand feet out of a snowfield which slopes up to them in a series of broken ice falls in the summer the neve is almost all broken and crevassed the lower portion as it approaches the ice fall is i feel sure impassable after christmas it is quite bad enough in the early spring to make a sense of the peaks surrounding the neve a party must cross from the tasman via graham's saddle or from the fox glacier they can try to reach the neve from the terminal face if they wish to and i hope they will enjoy the experience wednesday september nineteenth note see appendix note seven end of note i fixed some measurement cairns along the side below camp two and we returned to camp one in the afternoon thursday september twentieth my horse had gone away down the river so i tracked and caught him below nisbet's hut returned to the camp in the afternoon and packed the whole of it to the hospital where i found arthur woodham alone stayed at the hut friday september twenty first i rode down to forks and found instructions from hokitika to go at once to gillespie's and with douglas explore the karangarua river this visit together with our work in the previous summer was productive of some interesting facts concerning the movement and general conditions of the franz joseph glacier in the first place the ice of the lower portion of the glacier appeared to be very soft and rotten in comparison to that of other glaciers a natural consequence of its low altitude the ice crystals were very large and easily detached and separated from one another it was very difficult in some places to form a step as a blow of the axe would scatter the loose crystals in every direction and sometimes when a step had been cut which to all appearance was as strong as necessary the floor would give way by crumbling under one's weight in the winter however during the last visit i found it much easier to get about because the ice was firmer and there was far less likelihood of rapid changes the constant alteration in the forms and shapes of the crevasses and seracs was in the summer most puzzling and sometimes an absence of a week would be sufficient for the ice to alter to such an extent as to render a new route necessary this activity is no doubt due as much to low altitude as to the speed with which the glacier descends over its rough bed it is not noticeable all over the lower portions of the trunk after an absence of a day or two we have found new crevasses open even on the dry ice and as already stated we constantly heard reports and felt a slight shock pass like a tremble over the surface while sitting in camp too we could hear the glacier cracking and groaning on a still night in fact one of the first things i noticed on my second visit was the absolute stillness of the nights compared with our summer experience 
I have already given some idea of the very broken surface of the glacier, and need only add that I have never seen one with so little good travelling on it. Having had a considerable experience on glaciers, I can generally find a route through rough ice without much loss of time, and certainly never expected to be reduced to leaving a line of marks behind for use on the return journey, as we did here. It was not really necessary, but it saved a lot of time, and was very little trouble. The broken surface will account for the absence of large deposits of surface moraine, which might be expected here owing to the broken nature of the hillsides and spurs in the upper part of the valley. Below Point E and Cape Defiance, there is no broken rock at all, save the slip which has recently come down, and is the cause of the single patch of surface debris now fast approaching the terminal face. The glacier seems to descend in two, and sometimes three, distinct layers. The upper one is pure white ice, and the lower ones generally dirty. The stones which fall into the crevasses are ground up like grain between two millstones, and wherever it finds an opening between two layers, the silt, resulting from the grinding, oozes out in the form of mud. I have found a hollow under such an outlet full of mud, to a depth of two feet or more. Owing to the nearness of the surrounding trees, there is a large amount of timber in the ice, and lying at the terminal face in the small moraines. Once or twice, while cutting steps near the junction of two layers, my axe struck a piece of wood and stuck fast in it. The timber on the glacier and at the terminal face has a smooth, worn look about it, as if it had been well sandpapered. It is chiefly rata, a very hard wood, and must have undergone a great deal of rubbing and grinding. In some places, the upper section of the ice could be seen standing away from the lower. Half a mile from the terminal face, I saw a space of three inches or more between the two layers, extending back into the ice for some distance, and everywhere on the glacier, if one happened to be cutting a step near the junction, a large piece of ice would break away, leaving a smooth, mud-covered surface at the top of the lower layer. The comparative motion of the ice in a glacier at different depths is little known, and could I think be measured at places on the Franz Josef with little difficulty. I fully intended to do it on my second visit, but had no time. It is here perfectly evident that the surface ice moves far quicker than the lower portion, for the upper layer of white ice can be seen at the terminal face, pushing its way over the lower layer, and periodically breaking off in large pieces. This possibility is due to the rocky obstacles at the terminal face, and underneath the glacier, obstructing the flow of the lower portion, while it does not interfere with the upper. The layers are horizontal in some places, and in others incline slightly against the flow of the ice. One very noticeable result of the large quantity of moraine debris falling into the crevasses and being ground up between the separate layers of ice is that the old terminal moraines are composed of a layer of rolled stones, with angular blocks on the top of them in some places, and in others are almost entirely made up of the former. This is, of course, because other slips have occurred in the past, and covering the glacier have travelled down with the ice. A large proportion of the stones, having dropped into crevasses, come out at the terminal face in a rounded form, while the balance has come down on the surface of the glacier, and been dropped over in an angular form onto the top of the other, thus forming the two sections in the terminal moraines. In some of the sea bluffs, the layers of rolled stones under angular blocks are easily to be seen, where the sea has cut into them and exposed a section of their formation. I have heard many theories put forward to account for this stratified appearance, though it is common in all old moraines. Douglas, in his report on the France Joseph, note, New Zealand Lands and Survey Report, 1893-94, to 94, end of note, written after our visit, mentions the process which is evidently going on at present in the glacier, and assumes rightly that a similar process went on in ancient times on a larger scale, and would account for the formations in the bluffs, which are, of course, old moraines. He is inclined to put forward a theory based on that assumption that the old moraines now forming the sea bluffs are not lateral, but terminal moraines. From what he has told me of his own observations, and from like observations, in a much smaller degree of my own, I agree with him that they are not lateral moraines, but I cannot go as far as he does and say that they are therefore terminal. There is, I imagine, no reason why the evidence of stratification should be confined to terminal moraines. May it not also exist in lateral moraines, when the ice is pushing its way over level country, and not between hillsides? 
for it would be depositing rolled stones from its lower portion and dropping them from its upper portion in the form of angular blocks along its sides as well as at its terminal face if this is a sound conclusion then the inland moraine hills which contain the two forms of stones may be either lateral or terminal moraines if the reasoning is not sound then all or nearly all the old morainic deposits must be terminal moraines and that i do not think can be admitted some ideas concerning the ancient glaciers and their deposits were put forward in the last chapter and if they are correct there would be a field of ice extending over almost the whole of the low country fed by the numerous glaciers from the ranges such an ice field before it broke up would not have either lateral or terminal moraines on the flat country for the debris would drop into the sea on one side or form a lateral terrace at the foot of the hills on the other on the period of retreat beginning it would gradually divide itself into separate streams corresponding with the glaciers supplying it and would leave behind it a confused mass of morainic accumulations which could hardly be classed as terminal or lateral moraines until it had almost retired into the hills these would be stratified having layers of glacier drift and angular blocks throughout other glaciers like the tasman balfour etc which are covered with great masses of angular rocks are not sufficiently broken or crevassed to swallow up a great amount of moraine thus the double process does not now go on to such a noticeable extent on these glaciers as on the franz joseph it is only during the next few years that it can be seen on the latter for when the present surface moraine caused by the slip has dropped over the terminal face there will be no more to come down on the surface unless another landslip covers the ice with debris the ancient waiho glacier may or may not have been of first-class importance douglas thinks that it was not because he cannot find any of the higher old ice lines which he has found in other parts in the upper valleys of the karangarua as will be seen later i noted several instances of these old ice lines which appeared in the form of distinct terraces in the rocky hillsides abraded by ancient glaciers douglas's remarks on the subject i quote, quote in valleys containing large glaciers i have always found four tiers of terraces or old ice lines these lines keep a wonderfully regular distance from each other and their inclination is very uniform from say four thousand feet to six hundred feet or seven hundred feet where the river valley breaks out of the hills the longer the valley the more gentle the slope the best places to see these lines are up the host near the eighteen mile bluff and better still the wonderful terraces of mount cariah up the arawata river where the old lines can be seen quite distinctly for four thousand feet up and running for miles down the valley in the smaller valleys two or three terraces are visible and in still smaller ones there are none from this i would conclude that the franz joseph although the largest glacier at present was during the great ice period of second or maybe even third rate importance it must have been far eclipsed by cooks and the karangarua end quote note new zealand lands and survey report eighteen ninety three to ninety four page seventy three end of note it is true that in the franz joseph branch of the waiho there are not four ice lines visible like there are in the two last named rivers but i do not think it necessarily proves that this was of second-rate importance the cooks karangarua and host river to my knowledge and the arawata river from douglas's accounts flow through harder and more solid country and therefore would show these old ice lines in a more distinct and lasting form the waiho is shattered country and the lines have probably worn away by the action of the climate and weather generally the enormous morainic accumulations around lake mapurica and even north of that point to a glacier of considerable importance about three miles below the junction of the two branches or five miles below the terminal face there is an old terminal moraine almost semicircular through which the river has cut a channel this is perhaps a hundred feet high but we had no time to examine it comparatively speaking this is a recent deposit but to which of the ice lines at present visible it belongs i would not pretend to say at no very remote period the waiho river flowed north into lake maporica and it is quite possible that this old moraine divided the river northwards until it was cut through by the water which again resumed its old course to the sea 
while speaking of moraines it is worth calling attention to the very ridiculous attempts this glacier has made to form lateral moraines below point e the rocky cape on the eastern bank there is a line of boulders about two hundred feet above the ice which have been left balanced in the most insecure manner on the bare rock slope just below camp two another small lateral line of stones can be seen in a precarious position the only real piece of lateral moraine to be found is above cape defiance in the bend by harper's creek the ice has flowed down the valley and meets this obstruction causing it to eddy into the bend and force its way up in great waves against the cape the likeness of a glacier to a river is here most evident for the ice is done exactly the same as a river would do in a similar case having flowed against the cape which projects twenty chains across the line of flow it has banked up behind it and turned round the rocky point in high pinnacles corresponding to the waves in a river and whereas a river would in a similar case deposit large masses of driftwood on a bank the glacier has thrown up a high lateral moraine of stones which have come down in the ice from above the ice fall it has also caused the debris to come to the surface and the ice in the bend is covered with stones the absence of all other lateral moraines is due to the solid rock walls which line the glacier on both sides below cape defiance and which are too steep to allow any stones to rest on them with the two exceptions mentioned by camp two also the broken nature of the glacier has caused all the debris to fall into crevasses and therefore has left very few if any stones for it to deposit on the sides when douglas and i were in the valley during our first visit we concluded from various signs at the terminal face and along the sides that a winter advance of considerable importance took place annually followed by a large summer retreat we had ample evidence of the latter and my visit in september was made in hopes of finding a decided winter advance we based our conclusions on the fact that in november eighteen ninety three when we arrived at camp one there was a beautiful cone of ice one hundred and ten feet in height between the strontian and muller rocks this was covered apparently with river-bed shingle and seemed to be due to a recent advance during the winter it touched the latter rock along its base to a height of twenty-five feet other evidence was found in the fresh dressed surfaces just beyond the edge of the ice which were of a lighter colour than the rock above and also there were signs of recent disturbances in small terminal moraines during our stay in the neighbourhood the rapid shrinking due to the low altitude of the ice was most marked the level of the top of the ice at the terminal face fell seventy feet between november first and march first by breaking and melting and the retreat during the same period was considerable the most noticeable was at the ice cone this was at the beginning of november quite perfect in shape and in the position already stated at the end of february it had lost all shape and collapsed into a small heap of dirty broken ice some thirty feet high besides retreating twenty-two yards in the front and about ten yards from the rock against which it originally rested a new rock which we named the outlet rock was uncovered during february near the outflow of the glacier to the extent of ten yards all along the eastern bank a general shrinkage was visible when we left and as far as we could see on the western side as well i was not however prepared to say that the ice was retreating on the whole because we fully anticipated that it would recover its lost ground again in the winter when the melting would not be so great for behind the sentinel an ice cone was thrown up considerably in advance of the rest of the glacier to a height of forty feet in five weeks at the end of the summer this lifted with it river-bed stones but did not last long for when we left it had begun to decrease in size again we made two marks by means of which a future visitor might test the retreat and i was able to use them again in my second visit when i also made several more cairns for future use instead of the large winter advance which we had anticipated i found a general and considerable retreat all over the glacier with the single exception of a slight advance between the barren and strontian rocks the ice behind the sentinel had in february eighteen ninety four been one hundred and twenty leagues distant from the rock and in september of the same year had retired to a distance of two hundred and twenty five links or a retreat of one point o five chains between harper and park rocks a new rock appeared which however may be part of the former it was buried in the ice and raked by pieces falling from above where the ice cone had stood 
there was a further retreat of about three chains and at the outflow the outlet rock was exposed for one chain or fifty links more than in february on reaching the eastern bank on the route to camp two the general shrinkage was most noticeable just below the point at which we left the ice was a creek we named arch creek it descended into a deep gorge with a rock wall of two hundred feet on the northern bank and perhaps one hundred feet on the southern in the mouth of this there was a large isolated rock the eye tooth estimated one hundred and twenty feet in height the ice which flowed past the end of the gorge was pressing against the outer side of the rock and in november eighteen ninety three was almost on a level with the top on our second visit it proved to have retreated on the south bank of the creek for forty feet and continuing along the glacier up the valley there was a general shrinkage of ten or fifteen feet while below camp two large holes appeared in the ice showing the rock and indicating a still further retreat in the future on crossing over to camp three at cape defiance we found that though the ice had pushed its way a little further into the mouth of the creek yet it was not banked up so high as formerly at the cape itself when pitching camp three the previous summer it will perhaps be remembered we built a flat platform of large stones in the bottom of the v-shaped valley formed by the moraine and hillside this was still there but the ice having retired and caused a subsidence of the lateral moraine the platform had fallen over or capsized without breaking towards the ice and instead of being level was now lying at an angle of twenty degrees opposite cape defiance above point e the ice had banked up higher at another rocky point but the gain there did not exceed the loss at the cape this may perhaps be merely a temporary upheaval and in the course of a few months the pendulum may swing again and the ice rise at the cape and fall on the other side it may only be due to the oscillation or lurching of the glacier in its downward path the temporary advance behind the sentinel observed in february followed by retreat and the retreat by the barren rock followed by advance in the winter may also be due to the same cause though all this had taken place in one winter it is possible that the glacier is only passing through a temporary period of retreat and that a great part of it is due to a mild season and heavy floods causing large pieces to break off frequently if the ice recedes at the same rate every year the glacier will in a comparatively short time become of second-rate importance i anticipate from the manner in which the fox glacier is holding its own that though no future advance will recover the ground lost by present retreat yet it will to some extent repair the damage or at least remain stationary but it is evident that this glacier is slowly but surely losing ground there are many interesting problems to solve in this valley but they would require considerable attention during prolonged and frequent visits it is little use for a man to go there in the way i have been he must have leisure and be able to afford good instruments and plenty of time here he would have a glacier at an exceptionally low altitude obviously flowing at great speed over rocky obstacles giving good opportunities of solving some of the most interesting questions of glacier motion such as the comparative rate of the surface and lower ice its effects on rocks and the variation in position of the great waves or undulations on the glacier the speed at which this vast body of ice flows would give more pronounced and satisfactory results than could be obtained on one of the slow-moving glaciers of other districts there are also many questions as to the position and extent of the ancient glaciers to be determined or at least the solution is to be looked for in the old moraine hills on the flats and in the old ice lines in the valleys the fact of there being four different ice lines or terraces shows i presume that the old glaciers had four separate periods of rest and possibly advance during their general retreat how long these various periods were and the distances between them have to be discovered and the franz joseph or fox glacier may offer evidence on these points to any one who is competent to collect and apply it the terraces of bare ice-worn rock without vegetation followed by another with vegetation of a certain age and yet another with trees of greater age may go far to help in the solution i shall always regret that i have not the means at my command to enable me to make a collection of data on the subject of the great ancient glaciers the answer to these problems is not to be found only in the low country but in remote valleys to which as yet no one but douglas and i have been and the most interesting one of all namely 
the valley which gives the key to the old glacier which formed the cascade moraine was explored by douglas and since then only visited by prospectors End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of pioneer work in the alps of new zealand by arthur paul harper this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail timmerman vaughan chapter twelve karangarua river with douglas again topography foota camp floods castles flat bark camp twain gorge alone regina creek on september twenty third mr ned gibb who has a store on the waikukupa river came up to the waiho on a visit to the diggers and i returned with him we had a long talk about golf for he was a caddy at st andrews before he came to new zealand and hadn't had a good pitch about the old game for nearly thirty years after staying a night at his house on the beach i continued my journey to gillespie's on my horse with my goods and chattels in two saddle-bags strapped one on each side when a few miles from gillespie's i discovered that one of my rolls had fallen off so started back at a gallop to pick it up because i had been riding close to the surf on the hard sand and was afraid that it would have gone out to sea after going about a quarter of a mile i saw it floating fifty yards out beyond the first line of breakers and travelling up the coast with a strong current which sets up the beach while the tide is going out before i could go in after it the bag sank and i had to sorrowfully jog on to gillespie's without it a week later the mailman coming down the beach picked up the contents at various places scattered over the sand some miles north of where i dropped it as generally happens on these occasions the most precious things were lost namely two pounds of boot nails tobacco seven pounds and two dozen quarter plates exposed on the franz joseph glacier on reaching gillespie's i found a note from douglas to say that he was at mr scott's farm on the karangarua river flats i therefore went on crossing cook river and saltwater creek one of the worst and most treacherous fords on the beach and reached scott's that evening here i found that douglas had been suffering greatly from rheumatism all the winter and though not really fit for it he was determined to come up the river at any rate as far as he could for some time previous to this the government were desirous of finding a pass by which a road or track for tourists could be taken from the hermitage to the west coast this pass they required to be quote, free of snow and ice for three months in the year end quote. it was well known from the eastern side of the divide that no such pass existed from the head of the godley to mount sefton and douglas had been up the copeland river a branch of the karangarua in eighteen ninety two and reported no such pass as required up that river our work therefore in the season of eighteen ninety three to ninety four had been the exploration of the waiho and cook rivers to prove that there was no route such as they required by those valleys and also to get reconnaissance surveys of this new country completed now however we had instructions to explore the karangarua and its branches and report on the possibility of a track up this river over some saddle into the landsborough river and down that valley to a pass found by mr t n broderick from lake ohall on the eastern side of the divide this would i pointed out be a very roundabout route but as it would combine both a report on the route and an exploration of the only district in south westland still unexplored the authorities decided to have it inspected the karangarua had been traversed up to castles flat a large open basin in the hills twelve miles from scott's house or sixteen from the sea beyond that point the twain and the main branch were both unexplored six miles above scott's the copeland river draining the divide from mount stokes la perouse to mount sefton joins the karangarua and on castles flat the twain draining the divide from mount sefton to mount monga flows into the main stream which takes its rise from the northern end of the hooker range the topography of this district is rather puzzling and somewhat difficult to describe clearly the dividing range after leaving stokes ten thousand one hundred and one feet runs practically south for four miles and then circles round in a southwesterly direction for another four miles passing the footstool nine thousand ninety seven feet sefton ten thousand three hundred and fifty nine feet to mount brunner from there it takes a southerly direction to mount monga eight thousand three hundred and thirty five feet a distance of some two or three miles and again strikes in a southwesterly direction to the host pass 
upwards of forty miles away. From Stokes, the Copeland Range branches off, and divides Cook River from the Copeland River, and from Mount Sefton, the Karangarua Range, runs slightly north of west for twelve miles, dividing the latter river from the Twain River. From Mount Monga, the Hooker Range runs for five miles, to Mount Howitt, due west, separating the Macaro Glacier from the head of the Twain River, and then turns in a southwesterly direction, continuing for about thirty miles, parallel with the dividing range, and with it enclosing the Landsborough River, which flows from the Macaro Glacier. From Mount Howitt, a short, precipitous offshoot, runs parallel to the Karangarua River for about seven miles, and divides the Twain River from the Karangarua main stream, which takes its rise from just under Mount Howitt, and has a saddle leading into the Macaro Glacier. The Hooker Range, therefore, has cut off the Karangarua Valley from the dividing range. The so-called main branch is really not the most important, and is, strictly speaking, a tributary of the Twain River. But when the lower part of the valley was traversed, these branches received their names, and they have been retained for convenience. In referring to them, I shall consider the Twain River the tributary of the so-called main branch. On the 1st of October, we left Scott's house, and camped some four miles above the farm, at the point where the river leaves the hills. We pitched the batwing in some tutu scrub on a sheltered flat, and remained there for a week. From here we blazed or cleared a track up the river for three miles, one mile above the inflow of the Copeland River, where we built a futa and made our second camp. A futa is a small shelter of bark and canvas, raised off the ground, in which to leave provisions and stores sheltered from the weather, wekas, and rats. The one we made here was four feet off the ground, with a floor of seven feet by four feet, and five feet from floor to roof. It was built of rata bark and saplings, and will in all probability stand for several years. Two of us put it up in half a day. On Saturday the 6th, three horses arrived, by previous arrangement from Scots, at Camp 1, and we packed enough provisions in the footer to last us for five months, with the help of birds. Above this camp our hard work began, for we had to carry everything up on our shoulders, this being the last point to which a horse could go. The stores we brought up to the futa were flour, soda and acid, side of bacon, rice, sugar, dry figs, chocolate, cocoa, tea, jam, treacle, a splendid thing for this work, oatmeal, a few tins of sardines and meat, two half-axes, two bill-hooks, a small frying-pan for baking, three billies of different sizes, three mugs, two plates, a tin prospecting dish, ice axes, ropes, instruments, cameras, plates, two bat wings, three flies, biscuits, soap, candles, matches, tobacco, alpine climbing lantern, salt and pepper. The provisions were supposed to last for five months, with the help of birds. The luxuries, such as cooking utensils and bat wing, would only be taken to the head of the Karangarua. Any further work in the Landsborough or Twain we intended to do in light order, that is, with a fly only, and the stores. The half-axes were necessary in case we had to cut a tree down to spar the river or a bad creek. The bill-hooks were for blazing a track. By way of amusement I had Cook's Voyages, Milton's Poems, and Pliny's Letters, in pocket editions, also two packs of cards. The latter I found most useful when alone, as I played patience, or had a game of cribbage, right hand against left, by way of a change. It is curious how one generally has a tendency to cheat in favor of the left hand. A blanket each and one spare one between us, sewing materials and boot nails, must be added to the above list, and in order to remind myself that I was a civilized being, and only temporarily a savage, I took a toothbrush and a comb. For medicinal purposes, Douglas carried, quote, painkiller, end quote, and pills, and I, quote, eucalyptus, end quote, depending on natural medicines for other things. Since I had last seen Douglas, he had lost Betsy. She had been with him on a spur of Ryan's Peak, and disappeared in a fog on their way down, no doubt having fallen into a fissure in the rocks, or perhaps over a precipice. Douglas had written asking me to bring him down a, quote, various pup, End quote. The greater the variety of breed, the better. But curious as it may seem, I could not get one at a reasonable price. It is really remarkable how valuable mongrel pups become when you want one. A dog which the owner was on the point of drowning yesterday is worth two pounds today when you make inquiries, 
consequently no sale results the owner loses a sure half-sovereign and the puppy probably loses his life in a week or two by running against a stray bullet which happens to be travelling near him douglas however had picked up a pretty little dog and we decided to name him after the first bird he found soon after we started he discovered a nest of blue duck's eggs so we dubbed him eggs it was fortunate that we did not wait for him to catch a bird for he turned out to be quite useless and only caught one weka some six months later poor dog it was not his fault even then because the weka charged him and he had to kill it a week of wet weather followed during which we staged three or four loads about two miles up the river and left them under a piece of canvas the place we named poison camp being the scene of one of douglas's many extraordinary escapes when working alone as he used to do a few years before he had started up the river by himself to explore it and got as far as this camp with his stores from here he went on to castle's flat to reconnoitre the route and returned in the evening intending to move his camp next day he had with him a tin or two of sardines and one of them poisoned him he was ten days there by himself very ill and sometimes delirious finding himself more than once away in the bush without any recollection of leaving the batwing it was also raining a great deal so besides sickness he was nearly all the time wet no one but douglas would have survived such an experience this misfortune of course terminated his exploration of the river for a time at any rate on reaching scott's again he opened another tin and gave the cat some of its contents to see if they were the cause of his illness the cat only ate one or two of the sardines and died a few hours afterwards which was fairly good proof of the exceptional quality of those fish the return of his rheumatism compelled douglas to go back to scott's on the seventeenth and in three days a young fellow arrived at the camp to go on up the river with me while alone at the foot of camp i had the opportunity of seeing how quickly a westland river can rise in heavy rain on the nineteenth having been up the river with another load i turned in early in the evening and at nine p m the weather was quite clear i do not know when it clouded over or began to rain but at two a m i woke up finding the bat wing flooded by three or four inches of water in which i was lying i got up and drained the camp with my ice axe and could hear the river which was about twenty yards away coming down in a regular flood at five a m i went across to the bank and marked the height of the water which in the early morning light looked splendid there was not a boulder to be seen and branches of trees were careering down in the swirling yellow water opposite the camp there were some stones ten or fifteen feet in height and they were invisible turning in again soon i slept till ten o'clock and on waking found the sun shining brightly and the river already lower i afterwards measured the rise and fall of the water carefully and found that between the commencement of the rain and five a m say five hours the river had risen fifteen feet and by four p m had fallen eight feet regaining its normal level some time during that night the great rise is due to the course of the river being narrow at this point from the futa to poison camp was for a west coast river good going but beyond there was half a mile of very rough boulder travelling not nearly so bad as cook river but quite rough enough it is purely a matter of comparison as to good and bad travelling on these rivers i have no doubt whatever that any one who had no previous experience of a west coast river would consider the piece from the futa to poison camp decidedly rough going as the stones are from one to three feet in diameter and the half mile above the latter place he would only be able to describe in superlatives for cook river would either be left undescribed or the description would be unparliamentary when i speak of good travelling i mean only good compared with the average river going it is really quite bad enough on the twenty second my new companion and i went up with heavy loads i had eighty pounds and he had sixty five pounds to castle's flat and when doing the last half mile were very sorry we had not made two trips with light loads instead of one with heavy at four o'clock we reached a knoll or hillock covered with rata trees three-quarters of a mile above the lower end of the flat and here we camped about twelve miles from scott's two more days were spent in staging up some of the stores left at poison camp and by the twenty-fifth we had made everything snug at camp three putting a bark wall six feet high in a circle of twelve feet in diameter right round the camp as we intended to make this our base of operations 
and as it would probably be left standing for three months, we made it very substantial, pitching a large seven-by-four-foot batwing and ten-by-twelve-foot fly inside the bark wall. Bark camp, or camp three, though airy, was the most palatial residence we ever had the whole time we were out, but of course it was only our head camp, and unless wet weather compelled us to stay in it, we should be away for weeks at a time. As it turned out, however, I had nearly two months on this flat, as will be seen later. Similar flats are to be found on many of the West Coast rivers, luckily for the unfortunate explorer. It would be heartbreaking work to toil up narrow, boulder-filled valleys or rock-bound gorges, without some hope of a piece of easy going, and the relief of a mile of flat walking after several days of crawling and climbing over large boulders is beyond belief. One feels quite a new man, and after leaving the flat, ready to attack the inevitable gorge with renewed vigor. One or two rivers, however, are without any easy traveling for their whole length. Cook's, for instance, was more or less all rough, and certainly had no flat, and Douglas speaks of the Turnbull River further south, which he explored, as having sixteen miles of gorges, out of a total length of eighteen miles. A small flat of half a mile on such a river would make the whole difference to the exploration, for instead of being a grind, it would be a pleasure. Like most of these basins in the heart of the ranges, Castle's Flat is the centre of some magnificent scenery. In fact, from the time the low country is left behind, until we come back down the rivers, notes of admiration are necessary, so far as scenery is concerned. It is a level patch of ground surrounded on all sides by high rocky mountains, which form an oval basin, one and one half mile long and one mile wide. About the middle of this basin was Queen's Knoll, at the foot of which we made bark camp. It is a matter for scientific men to decide how these flats are formed, but here, I believe, a lake existed at one time. The surrounding mountains are steep and bare, with rocky slopes incapable of holding any glacial deposits, rising for some thousands of feet very abruptly out of the flat. At the southern end, or the corner, as I named it, the main branch of the Karangarua comes in, through a rocky gorge and over high cataracts. On the eastern side, the Twain River and Regina Creek flow through similar great gorges and cataracts, divided by a high conical hill of rock, and join the main river about the middle of the flat, the former about a quarter of a mile above Bark Camp, and the latter immediately opposite, across the stream. At the northern or lower end of the basin is a large bar of glacial deposit, augmented probably by slips from the hills. This bar has, perhaps, caused the river to flow more slowly, and consequently to deposit a large amount of small gravel, gradually filling up the valley to its present level, and at the same time spreading out to a greater breadth. But I think it is more probable that a lake has existed here in the past, for there are numerous terraces on the flat, showing that it was once considerably higher, and it has since been cut down by the river. The bar of old moraine at the lower end would have caused the river to back up and form a lake, while the constant denudation of the hills in the upper valley, and the numerous slips of which there is evidence, would by slow degrees have filled up the valley, until the lake ceased to exist. The channel through the bar has then, in the course of time, become lower, and allowed the river to reach its present level, leaving the flat high and dry, and also the above-mentioned terraces. In the middle of the river opposite Bark Camp was an island which, with Queen's Knoll, is nearly all that remains of an old terminal moraine, they are both composed of great boulders, heaped up promiscuously, amongst which large rata trees are growing. The island had a single kiwi on it, so I named it Crusoe's Island. The rest of the flat was lightly timbered and covered with very dense scrub, of ten to twenty feet in height, until some of the higher terraces were reached, and these had older and larger trees on them. There were also three or four small pakahis, or spaces of open grass, perfectly useless for pastoral purposes, but pleasant to walk over after emerging from the scrub. The general level of the flat was 680 feet above the sea. My present plan was to follow the Duane to its source and cross over a saddle into the McCarrow Glacier and Landsborough River, follow that valley down to Broderick's Pass, some 25 miles or more, and then, returning to the McCarrow Glacier, find my way over into the Karangarua main branch, and follow it down to Castle's Flat again. This would probably have taken two months, if the weather was not unusually bad. On the 25th, 
we forded the main branch just above the inflow of the twain river and blazed our way with billhooks along the south bank of the latter stream hoping to find a route through the decidedly ugly-looking gorge in this we were disappointed for after a day's hard cutting we emerged from the stunted vegetation on to a sheer smooth face of rock rising hundreds of feet out of the water without any chance of a route as we got further into the gorge the hillsides became steeper and the vegetation more stunted and at last it was evident that we should hardly be able to traverse this side with heavy loads though we might do it in our present unburdened condition telling my mate to await my return i went on to see what the place looked like round a rocky point ahead the sides now were practically sheer precipices and i was clinging on to the scrub entirely having at last come to the end of the vegetation and reached the bare rock i could see that no man could get along on this bank for the rock was smooth and perpendicular throwing out short buttresses of rounded water or ice-worn rock affording no more hold than the side of a house hearing the water a long way below i caught hold of a shrub above with one hand and leant out to look at the river and it proved to be two or three hundred feet below me to show how precarious a hold the vegetation has in such places my weight caused the whole mass of scrub for twenty feet above me to leave the rock and stand out a foot or two in a perfect network of roots with apparently no hold on the cliff for twenty feet where there was evidently a crevice or a ledge it can be imagined that i did not waste many minutes getting back to where the side was sloping less steeply having no wish to further test the strength of the roots i believe if the roots were cut along the ledge above that the whole network of vegetation would fall outwards like a curtain for twenty or thirty feet the gorge now that we could see into it was truly magnificent the south bank rose nearly sheer that is precipice after precipice with ledges here and there for some three thousand feet straight out of the water in places great overhanging rocks frowned down upon us from above and seemed to be ready to topple forward as we climbed along beneath them at one point the rocks leaned over to such an extent that a stone would have fallen one thousand feet without touching the cliff once on its descent the opposite side sloped back at an angle of nearly forty degrees and was covered with luxuriant bush through this gorge the river descends some five hundred feet in about three hundred yards over large boulders up to and over forty feet in diameter which are jammed in magnificent confusion into the narrow rock-walled channel forming a cataract to which i have never seen its equal above the cataract the gorge continues with its stupendous walls for over a mile and a half and then the valley takes a bend away southwards toward the glaciers of mount sefton this river descends two thousand five hundred feet in three and one quarter miles through two gorges it was quite evident that the north side would be the best to attempt for it was not by any means so precipitous and had trees growing on it which would afford shelter and firewood the twain was without doubt going to give us some trouble and it would be by no means easy to take our loads through so bad a gorge my companion thought it very grand and was surprised when i told him that of course we should take our camp through if possible he seemed to have some idea that we should make no further attempt to get up the river the next day sending him down to the futa for a load i traversed some of the larger creeks below the flat and brought up a fifty of flour in the evening and on the twenty seventh we both went to poison camp for the rest of our stores there spending the afternoon in completing our shelter and bathing in a fine pool close to camp during these two days my mate was somewhat silent and occasionally sounding me as to the idea of going on into such bad-looking country he couldn't understand how we were to find our way if no one had been in front of us nor could i excite his enthusiasm by saying we were the first two in that country i was hardly surprised therefore on sunday morning the twenty eighth to find that he was going back to scots before it was too late i remonstrated with him but all to no purpose it's too lonesome he said up here i'm going back as long as we are together i suggested it would not be lonesome oh well he answered i'm not the sort that likes being stuck away up here anyhow i like seeing life i admit the idea of any one seeing life in south westland or anywhere else on the coast amused me somewhat and as i knew he had never been away from the district i said good heavens man where can you see life at gillespie's of course was the answer given with considerable surprise at my ignorance a somewhat feeble description of gillespie's has already been given so it may be imagined the idea of seeing life there 
was rather too funny to be taken seriously, and I fear that the guffaw which greeted his answer hurt his feelings. He left me alone in my glory that morning, taking down a message to Douglas to try and send someone else, and also some letters to post. The fact of the matter is that he was frightened of the rough work, like most other young fellows of the district, for, except south of the Host River, it is hardly possible to induce a man to go into the ranges. This has been Douglas's experience in the past, and is the reason why he did so much of his work alone. The weather up to this point had been rather finer than usual, but on the 28th it began to rain, and continued for a week without interruption, confining me to my shelter with little to do. Luckily I had brought up a flute, but something went wrong with the works, and the lower three notes refused to make any sound. There are not many tunes which one can play on three notes only, so beyond several hours of vigorous puffing, to get more than a wheeze out of the low notes, the instrument afforded little amusement, but a great deal of hard work. Heavy rain has its advantages in the ranges, as well as its drawbacks, for, when amongst the great rock peaks, the waterfalls are wonderfully fine. One day during this week, I counted no less than eighty-six good falls within half a mile of camp, varying from two thousand to three thousand feet in height, those coming down the great rock slopes of Mount McGloin being magnificent. This peak is situated on the southern side of the flat, and its bare rock slopes rise to a very steep angle, and in places sheer precipices, to a height of over five thousand feet above the flat. The weather cleared on Guy Fawkes Day, but as the rain had been cold and snow had fallen on the tops, the river was not high. Deciding, therefore, to explore the creek I had named Regina, I forded across from the camp to Crusoe's Island, a distance of eighty yards, and again from there to the other side, another fifty yards, finding the stream just strong and deep enough to necessitate the use of a pole. Regina Creek joined the river at this point, after descending through a boulder-filled gorge, and over a grand cataract of seven hundred feet, in a quarter of a mile. Not only is the course of the creek filled with large stones, but the hillsides, far up into the bush, present as rough a piece of travelling as I have seen since Cook's River the year before. It took no less than an hour to go the last six chains at the top of the cataract, through large forest trees growing on and amongst boulders of all sizes, up to sixty feet in height, and two hundred feet in girth. Sometimes deep gaps between these would be spanned by an old tree trunk, over which was the only way to cross, and very uncanny it was. One never could be sure that the bridge would bear, and the hole in most cases had water at the bottom, in semi-darkness, in which I could see my reflection as I passed over. At the top of the cataract the valley, as usual, opened out into a broad basin, lined with bold precipitous mountains, at the bottom of which the stream flowed through a small flat. A mile above the great cataract a smaller one was met with, beyond which the valley again opened out, and showed another rock-bound basin, with a small secondary glacier at its head, which supplies the creek. Though Regina Creek is on a smaller scale than the Twain Gorge, it has very grand scenery, and would eclipse many favorite resorts in Europe with its attractions. I should, however, prefer not to be the unfortunate man who has to engineer a track or road through those terrible boulders, which have to be negotiated before the upper valley is reached. At the foot of the cataract, there was another instance of that reasoning power of trees, already referred to. On an isolated boulder in the stream, two large rata trees were growing, and evidently found their rocky home too small to give sufficient nourishment. No doubt when young saplings, they had quite a good time, but now they were full-grown trees, and had to find better means of support. The rock was ten yards from the bank, and one of the trees had sent out a sucker, or arm, across the intervening riverbed, to the richer soil of the terrace. The sucker was about the thickness of a man's arm, and had twined round two stones, about one and two feet in diameter, on its way to the bank. On reaching the terrace it had lifted itself from the riverbed, and raised with it the two stones, which were to be seen quite four feet from the ground, firmly held in its clutches. The sixth and seventh were wet again, and the river rose too high to allow me to ford it safely, so instead of going to the Twain Gorge, I carried the traverse up to the foot of the Karangarua cataracts, and went for a quarter of a mile along a very bad and precipitous hillside into the gorge. It is not so fine as that of the Twain, but, if the latter was not so close, the Karangarua cataract and gorge would strike anyone as a very grand piece of scenery. The only result of this day's work is summed up in my diary. Quote, the gorge will give us some trouble. End quote. 
and it did i now had nine more wet days during which the river rose eight feet even on the flat a real old man flood it must have been very high in the narrow valley by the futa and in the gorge it was of course impossible to go up to see the cataracts but they must have been a wonderful sight i could see great jets of water shooting up now and then above the high trees from the regina gorge on sunday eighteenth it cleared up again so i took a day off and hung everything out to dry and had a general washing of clothes i do not mean to convey the impression that this was the first time i had washed clothes since leaving scott's that very tiresome operation was carried out every week when possible and as we never took a change except an extra shirt and pair of socks we had to sit in our blankets while washing and drying the garments on the nineteenth i went down to the futa for a fifty of flour and some odds and ends the long spells of wet weather had been rather dismal for me by myself for it had put all the creeks in flood and prevented any work it also cut me off from scott's because no one could have come up in the present state of the rivers however the last three notes of the flute had not yet given forth any music therefore until they did i had some employment and if by any chance i had made them sound then there were reasonable hopes of a tune sooner or later stores also were plentiful and so far there had been no lack of birds so i was able to spend considerable time in preparing meals of several courses and in more time in discussing them for i generally had to cook the next course while eating the one just cooked the menu on a wet evening when there was plenty of food and time to cook it may be interesting potage weka kiwi and pick a pick a fern poisson sardine à l'ouïe entrée sardine à la carangarua relève boiled kiwi légume boiled picky picky fern roti roast weka entremet flapjack and jam savoury sardines on toast dessert one dry fig sometimes the birds would be roasted on the end of a stick and on sundays we allowed ourselves one onion if we had any by way of a treat we tried on these swell occasions to imagine our tea was brown sherry of course only in wet weather did i try to raise a smile on my own face by going through the formality of a long dinner in fine weather there was too much work to do and when any one was with me time did not pass quite so slowly sardine a la carangarua is a rather good dish cut a thin strip of bacon roll a sardine in it fry for a few minutes and as the cookery books say serve hot on toast End of chapter twelve